good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. And, uh, to our viewers on YouTube, we say good morning to you as well. Um, and we want to welcome also One Source. Our friends are here today, so we'll be blessed uh, with their presence. Um, I'd like you to stand for a moment, if you would. Deb and I, in our travel, we do our mission work. It's common that when God's word is read, that people stand. So, uh, if you have a bulletin, look at the front with me, Psalm 119. And let's read it aloud together. So you can listen for my voice to start. We'll read this together. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. And I'm also going to read Psalm 34, 3. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. That's why we're here today. Let's uh, pause for a moment of silence. If you're like me, sometimes we've got to get the clutter out of our mind and our heart and get ready to worship. So I'll pause and then I'll pray for our time together. Lord, we gather uh, to glorify you and exalt your name. Thank you for this day, for this church, for this community. We welcome you here this morning, Jesus. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Um, our order of service is a bit different today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go through announcements, scripture reading, all the things normally that the person doing the opening does. Uh, and then we're going to welcome our friends from one source to come and lead us. So let's uh, first take a look at our bulletins together. Just a few things I want to highlight. Um, Wednesday, um, two things happening, a work day this week at 9, as well as our adult Bible study, and upcoming and two important dates related to Sunday school, one is the kickoff breakfast on the 11th, and uh, September 18th, and the Sunday school classes start back up at 9.15. Um, I'm glad uh, this morning that I realized one of the announcements was taken out. I just want to highlight that it was a great thing. We were going to ask for someone to help uh, Paul as a backup for what's going on in the, in the back of the video, and already two people had come forward, so we're grateful for that. That's great news. So, um, All right, first-time visitors, just want to look around. If you're here for your first time, can you raise your hand? And I always look, make sure you're not hiding. Okay. All right. Birthdays. I, I think Barb Brown is here. Where's Barb at? Oh, there you are, Barb. Um, oh. I wasn't necessarily going to make you do it, but Tom's got the microphone, so. <laughs> when we're in need of that. 
that, Lord, it is everything to us. And Lord, we are grateful to be part of a church that stands on the Word of God, that it is inerrant and complete. And Lord, so guide us. Um, pray not only for this uh, next few minutes as we consider your Word, but later as Bruce brings the message, we pray for open hearts, Lord. Speak to us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Augustine is credited with the expression solvator ambulando, which means it is solved by walking. And whenever I hear that expression, I think, what is solved? And I think perhaps many things. The Apostle John wrote, whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus walked. Jesus was a pedestrian. In the Bible, it is less common to see him preaching in the temple than it is walking. He walked out into the desert to be tempted. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Come follow me, he said. He even walked on water. And it was while he was walking along a road, a man said, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus walked out of the city of Golgotha, stumbling all the way to his death for love. And he walked back into life again with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus walked. How did Jesus walk? I would suggest he walked slowly and attentively. In John 5, 19, Jesus said this, Truly, truly, I tell you, the Son can do nothing by himself. He can only do what he sees his Father doing because whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Many passages in Scripture have the expression, Jesus saw. And Jesus saw because he was never in a hurry. Jesus walks slowly because God is love. Love has a speed. It's an inner speed. It's a spiritual speed. It's the speed of our soul. It's a different kind of speed from the technological speed to which we're accustomed today. It is slow, and yet it is king over all other speeds because it is the speed of love. In our culture, we walk fast, we talk fast, we text fast, we eat fast, and then excuse ourselves by saying, I've got to run. But hurry keeps us consumed by the cares and the riches and pleasures of life, as Jesus put it, and it prevents Jesus' way from taking root in our hearts. Following Jesus can't be done at a sprint. If we want to follow someone, we can't go faster than the one who's leading. And Jesus went slow. Our tendency is to hurry, and that causes a diminished capacity to love. Love and hurry are fundamentally incompatible. Love always takes time, and time is one thing hurried people don't have. And it's because it kills love that hurry is the great enemy of spiritual life. Hurry prevents us from receiving love from the Father, and it pre prevents us from giving it to other people. That's why Jesus never hurried. And if we're to follow Jesus, we must learn to walk slowly. Because by definition, we can't move faster than the one we're following. Our community needs our love. Love has a speed, so let's walk slowly. Let's see what the Father's doing and join in with that. Amen? Amen. 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 Now it's time for a, a praise and prayer time. Um, any prayer needs today? I've got a few things noted. Certainly we're going to pray for what happened at the cafe this week and all those affected by that. Um, other things we normally do pray about with Ukraine and uh, Sunday school starting. But any other prayer needs uh, that you have this morning? Chuck, I can hear Chuck from here. You can talk loud yeah, and I'm here to Chuck. That's fine. Uh, Diane is traveling this week. She's been visiting her sisters in uh, Atlanta and in North Carolina. Okay. She'll be good back on Wednesday, so uh, safe travels for her. Okay. Thank you. Okay. 
I'll share two things this morning. We have a dear friend, um, used to be in the military, now works for the State Department, now working in Somalia. And if you caught the news this week, Al Shabaab, there was an attack on a hotel. But his compound was about a mile away, so I praise that uh, our friend James is safe. And uh, we had a work team from YWAM this week at our place. We have another next week, so just praying praise and also safety for those that will be working on our place this week. So, all right, let's pray as we as before I pray out loud. We'll just pause for a moment. If there was something you didn't share, you can uh, lift that up to the Lord in your heart. And uh, after a few moments, pause. Then I'll pray for these requests. Lord, thank you for hearing all these individual prayers uh, that were lifted up. We just come alongside that, Lord, as a congregation. Um, Lord, this morning we pray for the things that have been shared. We pray for uh, Tid Graff, those that will be going to visit with him. And just pray that can be a real encouragement, a time of comfort, just a good time of fellowship in the midst of challenge. Lord, we're grateful that uh, you watch over us, your angels do. Diane will be traveling this week. Anyone else with travel, Lord, we pray uh, you would watch over them. And uh, Lord, yeah, just give them safety. I thank you, Lord, for times that you've protected us and we're not even aware uh, that this last week, certainly aware of our friend James who loves you and uh, uh, does an amazing work in what he does. But thank you that he was protected in the attack. And, Somalia. Um, thank you for so many that have come to help uh, Deb and I with, with what we do up on the property. And so uh, those YWAMers that are coming this week, we pray mostly that they would be encouraged as we engage with them, uh, and safety over them, Lord, as they do their work. Lord, we continue to lift up the entire situation in Ukraine and uh, just encourage everyone each week to look at the missionary feature and make sure to, to lift those prayers up throughout the week. But Lord, we just, we pray for an end to this craziness. We pray for protection of workers, and especially for children, families to be reunited, and Lord, for, for you to be exalted in the midst of that, that crazy situation right now. Lord, we're Fall is coming, and uh, that means the start of Sunday school. I just pray uh, your blessing and hand upon these coming months and be a tremendous time uh, of learning for all those that will be there. Pray for Bruce this morning. We thank you for him, and, and uh, may his words be yours this morning. Uh, as, uh, as we were talking earlier, the, the book of Romans is certainly a challenging book to bring out and to preach on and teach. And so thank you for all that Bruce does in studying and listening to your heart. Pray for Carolyn too, Lord, all that uh, her and Bruce both carry um, in leading uh, this church. Lord, we continue to pray for our valley. We, we pray um, that it would be, our church could be a light in this place and that people would have a hunger and uh, just a stirring in their hearts. Those that don't know you would would want to, and that we would be available, Lord. Uh, as I said a little bit ago, we would walk slowly and see those opportunities. Thank you for everyone that came to uh, put the fire out at this one cafe. But Lord, what a oh, what an unexpected thing for all those involved, um, for Jesse and his family. Uh, Lord, we pray um, just as a community that when we went through this with the Merck, that uh, certainly the community would rally around them. We pray that your love could be shown to them and uh, that a plan forward they could sense. But give them comfort and peace this week. We thank you that no one um, was injured uh, and certainly not in the building at the time that happened. Pray for our state, our nation, our leaders, Lord. May your Holy Spirit bring people to conviction and people would align their, uh, their worldview would become your worldview, Lord, not the politics of our day 
but truly led by you, Jesus. We want to thank you for all those that give so much, uh, our military, their families, law enforcement, emergency services. Uh, they sacrifice a lot, and we pray, Lord, that you would uh, be with them to strengthen them and be their peace. For the persecuted church, Lord, so many things happening around the world we're not even aware of. Certainly the media does not report it, and I pray that we keep our ear open so we can all be prayerful for those struggling and suffering, even to the point of death this day. But thank you for the promise of your word that uh, if they are to die today, that they will receive a beautiful crown of life. Lord, we thank you for our friends from one source who are with us once again today. Just pray. Um, they really feel just an overflow, abundance of your love for each one of them. That that would just pour through them and touch our lives as we worship together. So bless them, not just this day, Lord, but in the days ahead. Uh, in their homes, in their families, and everywhere they travel to minister. Bless them. We love you. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. All right. I think one source is coming. Hopefully you're...
must be trying on my own again I'm guessing nobody learns to walk before they stand time and time again you think I learned
to rephrase that. The Lord impressed upon me to sit down and <laughs> Oh
I'm still trying to get used to this new microphone. Leon had to come up and tell me it wasn't on. Some of you weren't going to tell me that, were you? I'm going to be content with that. So. Well, we are going to continue in Romans 9 today. We're going to look at verses 10 through 13. And uh, I told you earlier, Carolyn and I, we've been a little disjointed this last month. We had gone for two weeks to a wedding, our grandson, we had family there, we got back for about two days, and then we had more children and grandchildren show up for two weeks. I love my children and I love my grandchildren, but when they come to visit, there's two very special moments. One is when you see them coming down the driveway that first time. The other is when you see them going the other way, down the driveway. So. We're, uh, and we're trying to get organized. We're half moved into the new house and half... I couldn't find socks this morning, so I don't know if you've ever tried to wear cowboy boots without socks, but that doesn't work very well. So. <laughs> but we're getting close. Just pray for us. We're getting close. And to top it all off, we come to some of the most difficult scripture in all of the Bible when we get here to Romans 9. And so I spent a lot of time, and, and actually... Uh, we're kind of going to ease into it this week. Next week is going to be even more difficult. So I spent a lot of time listening to what the really smart PhD folks had to say about this. and Maybe that was a mistake. Um, I think part of the problem that we get to sometimes is, is we get away from what Scripture actually says. That's what we're going to talk about in these next couple of weeks is what Scripture actually says. It's okay, you know, to have, uh, to come to conclusions or theories or something because of what you've read, but based it on scripture, I, I'm pretty simple. In fact, I'm terribly simple. If, if you want to tell me this is what God does and this is what God doesn't do, show me in scripture, okay? Show, show me in scripture. Well, one, one of the commentators <laughs> I read uh, this week when I was going through this, he said, if you are a smart pastor, and if you're going expositorily through the book of Romans, you will skip from the end of chapter 8 to the beginning of chapter 12, and nobody in the church notices. <laughs> well, I'm not very smart because we're not going to do that. We're going to muddle our way through it. So today, again, Romans 9 and beginning in verse 10. Now, if you remember, you were here last week or saw the, uh, the YouTube you know that last week the Apostle Paul, he introduces three principles to, to help us explain God's work in redemptive history. Now we discussed two of them last week. And by way of review, that first principle was that the special privileges that God grants to nations and to individuals has nothing to do with whether they are saved or whether they will be saved. And that the second thought is that uh, uh, God's salvation is always based on God's promises. Salvation is always based on divine promises. Quite simply, God will do what he has said he's going to do, and he will do it in his way, and he will do it in his time. So, as I told you last week, we're going to go into this third principle today, and we're actually going to touch on it fairly heavily today, uh, today and next Sunday and off and on all the way through chapter 11. And unfortunately, as we do, we're going to enter into a doctrinal issue that at least in my opinion has caused way too much division in the church. So today we begin a discussion on God's sovereign election versus humanity's free will and what those either either the, what they do or what they don't do in regard to salvation. So Romans 9, beginning in verse 10, as always, before we go to Scripture, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, I just lift this time up to you. It's always my earnest prayer that you would just set me aside, that you'd speak through me, Father. But particularly today, as we, as we enter some difficulties, I just pray that you would give me clarity of thought, that it would be your words, Father, and not mine, that we would look at these verses with absolute truthfulness, and more than anything, Father, that your Holy Spirit would just reveal the truths that we find in these verses to each and every one of us. 
And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Read this. But there was Rebecca also, and when she had conceived twins by one man, our father Isaac, for, the, for though the twins were not yet born and had done nothing, good or bad, so that God's purpose, according to his choice, would stand, not because of works, but because of him who calls. It was said to her, the older will serve the younger. Just as it is written, Jacob I loved, but Esau I hated. So this third principle, as we started this, this third principle of salvation never takes notice regarding to, at least from the human perspective, whether we are good or bad. Does that surprise you? I think it surprises some of you. But it's true. And not only is it true, but it needs some explanation. I don't want anybody to go home today and say, the pastor told me I could be just as bad as I wanted to be. I think we need to have some understanding here. Uh, first thing is that we tend to misunderstand this statement. Because there, there, there is an assumption here on many people's part that we enter this world, when we are born, we enter in a state of neutrality, neither good or bad. And that's not true. Scripture is clear. We went through it earlier in Romans. We are born in sin. That's something that we inherited from our original father, Adam. We're born in sin. And the only goodness that we're ever going to have is at that time when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior and we receive his righteousness. The scripture told us it is imputed to us, the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us by God. If you can remember back, or if you've got your Bibles and you want to look, if you remember back the third chapter of Romans, the 12th verse, it told us this. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. And listen here. And there is no one who does good. Not even one. Doesn't say most people don't, some people don't. It says there is no one that does good. And to make an emphasis, he adds, not even one. So let's be clear. No one is going to earn their salvation by being good. But I'm going to encourage you to go ahead and do your best to be good anyway. <laughs> so we have this example of Esau and Jacob. Your Old Testament scholars, you know who, who we're talking about. Abraham, the first patriarch, the father of the nation of Israel. He had a son named Isaac. Isaac had twin boys, Esau and Jacob. That's where we are now. I told you last week, Jacob's the one who wrestled with God's angels, and his name was changed to Israel. So through his 12 sons, we get the 12 tribes of Israel. So that, that's a catch up there. And so anyway, we have these two twin boys. And I would argue that from a human perspective, if you read in Genesis about these folks, you could make an argument that Esau was the better person. Yet God chose Jacob and passed over Esau. Although it should be noted from a human perspective that God certainly did lavish many blessings, materially speaking, many blessings on Esau. But he chose Jacob to be the seed of the promise. He chose him to be the one through his lineage that the Messiah would come into the world. This quotation, Jacob I love but Esau I hate it, that comes from Malachi chapter 1 verses 2 and 3. And we struggle with those words, don't we? If we just read them in passing without understanding, we struggle. That sounds terribly harsh. And I'll try to explain. Really, what Paul is saying in quoting these words is that ancestry does not make a, per a person righteous before God. The twin sons of Isaac and Rebekah had the same father. They had the same mother. They were born minutes apart. Yet one was accepted by God and the other not. And so we ask why. This is a phrase that I'm, I'm going to share with you right now that came, it's a direct quote from one of the, one of the commentators that I read. 
And it needs some explanation, but you're not going to get it until next week. So you've got to come back next Sunday, okay? So why? Why was Jacob accepted and Esau was not? It is because of the choices that they made. And those choices were totally different. Paul is saying that their choices, not their parentage, was the deciding factor in God's view of them. One of these twins, Jacob, again, was granted a place of prominence in human history. The other Esau was not. So back to this, why would God say, Esau I hated? Makes us wonder, is God harsh, is he cruel, is he arbitrary? I would say, again, if you have studied the life of these two, it is more difficult for me to understand the phrase, Jacob I loved. Jacob was conniving, he was a scheming man, he was a man of weak character most of his life. Esau, his brother, was a rugged individualist and seemingly the more admirable of the two from a human perspective, remembering that we know no one's heart. That's important to remember as we go through here. We know no one's heart. God does. So looking over the course of their lives, again, it was Jacob who was brought to faith in God, while Esau was not. And this Jacob became a symbol of how God works in human lives. Now bringing this thought a little closer to home, using myself as a personal example, it is easy when I take stock of the entirety of my life for me to understand why God would judge me. It's almost impossible me to understand why he'd love me. You know, we need to realize too, we get into one of these Hebrew, Greek interpretations and bringing it over to English, we need to realize that this word hated, the word hated as it was used is not as strong, nowhere as near as strong in the original language as it would appear to us in this English translation that we have. It's simply our best attempt to, to capture the sense of the original Hebrew word. And the original Hebrew word used here simply means to love less. And we can give you an example from Luke chapter 14, verse 26. Jesus, this is Jesus speaking, and this is what he said. If anyone comes to me and does not hate, there's that word, but remember, love less, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, obviously, if what Jesus really intended here was hate as to despise, as we would see the word, it would be in terrible, terrible contradiction to the rest of Scripture. If Jesus was really suggesting that we hated and despised these folks in ourselves, we would have a struggle with a lot of scripture, wouldn't we? But that's not what the word means here. In these verses, Jesus is simply making a comparison of how deep our love must be for him. How he must be the first love, the one we love the most in our life. And everything else in our life, while we love it, we love it less. So God is not saying that he despised Esau. Rather, God has chosen Jacob to be the father of a great nation. The one that would bring forth the promised Messiah. The redeemer of the world. But as I said earlier, even so, God clearly had regard for Esau. And he blessed Esau. And he made a great, great nation out of Esau's descendants. And speaking of that, just a little aside here. I think Chuck brought this up a couple of months ago, so I'm going to steal his line here. I'll act like it was my idea, okay? But the, <clears throat> the last struggle, the final confrontation between Jacob and Esau took place in the New Testament, centuries later, centuries after these two individuals lived. And that occurred when Jesus stood before King Herod, just hours 
before his crucifixion. You see, Herod was an Edomite, a descendant of Esau. Jesus, in his human lineage, was a descendant of Jacob through King David. So there, standing face to face, were Jacob and Esau. Herod had nothing but contempt for the king of the Jews, and Jesus would not open his mouth in the presence of Herod. Just an example of God's strange and mysterious ways of dealing with humanity. I'm going to remind you a lot as we go through this. I shared it last week of this verse in Isaiah 55. We need to bring that to mind as we go through this particular part of this study. And that verse tells us, His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. So Paul is teaching that God has a sovereign elective choreography that he exercises it on his own terms. One, salvation is never based on natural advantages. Two, salvation is always based on God's promises. And three, salvation is never based on whether we are, from a human perspective, good or bad. So I'm going to ask you now, as we've kind of gone through this, it's not unusual to have an adverse reaction to these verses. And it, I'll warn you, it's going to continue next week. So what is your reaction? How do you react to God's dealing with these two brothers? Does it seem arbitrary? Does it seem unfair? We're going to, especially next week, we're going to go to God's dealings with some other folks that will probably be even, seem even more that way. Because many times in our humanity, as we just read through this, we have a temptation to cry out, that is not fair. You ever raise kids? Well, hopefully not six of them, but isn't that what you hear from kids? That is not fair. That is unfair. Well, we have that attitude sometimes with God. And I will say this, when you have little bitty children, their understanding of what we're trying to do comes a lot closer than our understanding of what God's trying to do. But it's not unusual for us to think this is unfair. But I'm going to ask you, bear with me, we're going to continue, we're going to take a closer look. Again, it's not unusual for this initial reaction to be, it's unfair, when we come to this ninth chapter of Romans. It's normal to feel that God is being arbitrary when we look at this passage. But again, his ways, they're not our ways. Now, we're told in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, it says, shall we not trust the creator of the universe to be fair? It's another thought you need to hang on to. If we struggle to understand these verses, in the end, we need to understand that God will be absolutely just and fair. Just hang, hang home to that, that thought. We're going to continue in dealing with this God's election versus humanity's free will. And I think we're going to struggle because I don't believe as humans we will ever completely understand these conflicting concepts. Not on this side of the river anyway, but again, we can trust God to be fair. We also know that God never acts in a way that is inconsistent with his character. And so we ask ourselves, what do we know about God's character from Scripture? As we certainly know that the God of the Bible is a God who did not spare his own son, but gave Jesus over to be sacrificed for our sin. Our God is a God of love. But having said that, how do we reconcile the love of God with what seems to be an apparent unfairness? of God that we have seen so far in this chapter. But again, let's continue. Go through this chapter, bear with me, and see if we can't come to a point where we have a little more understanding of this, these strange and mis mysterious actions of God. I want you to consider this. This is maybe a fleeting example, maybe a poor one. I don't know, but it's an example, and it's the one I came up with. Centuries ago, there was a time when almost everyone believed that the earth was flat. I think that was probably comfortable to some folks, as long as you didn't fall off the edge, you know, if you stay in there. It was kind of a comfortable thought. But believing that didn't make it true, did it? 
As the evidence began to accumulate that the earth was indeed round and not flat, some people became very upset. And some of the people who became the most upset were the religious people of that day. They believed that the Bible taught that the earth was flat. They could even quote some scripture that they thought substantiated this fact. And it took many years and a lot of serious conflict before religious people realized that the earth was round. And surprisingly, if they studied their Bible a little closer, although it's not as easy for them as it is for us, they would have found out that the Bible some 2,700 years ago affirmed the, flat, the fact that the earth was round and not flat. You familiar with Isaiah? Chapter 40, verses 22? Again, centuries ago, long before this was ever settled, if they would have just paid attention to what the prophet Isaiah said in these words. So we have the prophet describing God, and he says, it is he who sets above what? The circle of the earth. It's right there in scripture. We could struggle with similar problems today here in Romans 9, and we'll probably continue to do so for a while. We've grown up, at least I've grown up, maybe some of you have, with this flat, two-dimensional view of God. It's comfortable. It's a safe view of God. We have Him acting in a certain way. We fit God into neat little theological boxes. But Paul here in Romans 9 comes along and he just kicks the dog out of those boxes. He tells us that God is infinitely greater than our theological categories. And if we want to understand the reality of God as much as is humanly possible, we have to set aside some of our preconceived notions. We must also consider that there are some mysteries of God that we are simply not meant to understand, at least not in this life. So next week, you're excited now, I know, you're all going to be back because next week we're going to dig a little deeper into this doctrine of God's election and man's free will. But it all starts, folks. The Bible tells us that this is all foolishness to those that are perishing. So it all starts by accepting Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And I hope you've done that. If you haven't done that, what a wonderful day to do that. I would love to talk to you. Continue to pray for revival. Pray that it would start right here in this church and in this community. If you have selected an individual, a family, or group to pray for, I hope you continue to do that. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this body of believers. I thank you for our dear friends, One Source, and their willingness again to come and share their musical talent with us, Father. And I just pray now that this church would continue to be salt and light here in this valley, Father. And Father, I do pray for your revelation of these difficult verses that we're going through now, Father. Just bring some clarity to our thoughts and to our heart. And I pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, I'm going to remind you, we have the... Uh, the love offering up here. We're going to come up and have a closing hymn. And then, Leon, would you close us in a word of prayer, please? Thank you.
just thank you for the time we've had this morning to be able to hear from one source, to hear from your word. I just pray as we go out that you will just help us to take these things we've heard today and put them into practice in our life. Help us to just step back and see you who for your word who you really are. Help us to love you, to make you Lord in our life. And when we come to things that we don't understand, just give us a desire to look further into your word, to understand more about who you are and that how you are truly a just God. And that though sometimes things might seem unfair to us, they're really not. And that we can trust in you. And I just pray that you will give us that confidence this week. In Jesus' name.